Turn to Nehemiah chapter 5, verses 1 through 19, which is the, it's the whole chapter. It just sounds nice. We go only 1 through 19. Um, but we're reading the whole chapter. And, and when I think about this chapter, when I was reading this passage, it was like, you know what? I kind of miss seminary, so let's come up with a fun title, Christlikeness 101. If you ever take a college course or a seminary course, 101, that's like, that's the easiest. That's like entry level. Okay, this is basic, foundational, where um, you're learning how to read. Um, or actually, not even that. You're learning how to count to 10 in the ABCs. Uh, and hopefully, I don't know, we might be able to get to a Christ likeness 505 eventually, but we'll see. But as I think about what it means to become like Christ, in God's infinite wisdom and his knowledge, and he makes no mistakes, each and every single one of us has a unique plan and a unique destiny, if you will. In short, we all have different syllabi for Christ-likeness 101. We have different assignments, different things that we have to study and learn to become like Christ. For some of us, it means losing a loved one that was very, very close to us. For others, it means going from job to job to job, living paycheck by paycheck, so we learn how to trust him and to be dependent on him. For us, it means having triplets. <laughs> yeah. um, it, infinite wisdom, he doesn't make mistakes. He doesn't. That's how we get to become like Christ, triplets. Um, and you know, speaking of classes, so this is Christ Likeness 101, I guess. Uh, Amber sent me a video of a preacher talking about, you know, so many parents want to be in Parenting 101, you know, where their child does everything they tell them the first go around. Um, they eat all of their vegetables, no complaining, no whining. They go to bed on time. They sleep through the night without a hiccup. They are little baby Jesuses. <laughs> um, but think about, and this is what the preacher said, but think about so many of the attributes of Christ that would not be developed in you if you didn't grow in patience because your child didn't test your patience. Or you didn't grow in unconditional love because they didn't bring you to your wits end. That you learned to show them grace and mercy when they were learning, as God does with us. Because we had Parenting 101 instead of Parenting 505. And so when we come to this passage, this is foundational. We see an example of Christ in the example of Nehemiah, he shows us Christ likeness 101. And um, this it doesn't stop here, but I think this is foundational and where we can enroll in Christ likeness 101. Kind of get back to the basics, if you will. And so here in Nehemiah chapter 5, beginning in verse 1, now there arose a great outcry of the people and of their wives against their Jewish brothers. For there were those who said, With our sons and our daughters we are many, so let us get grain that we may eat and keep alive. There were also those who said, We are mortgaging our fields, our vineyards, and our houses to get grain because of the famine. And there were those who said, We have borrowed money for the king's tax on our fields and our vineyards. Now our flesh is as the flesh of our brothers, our children are as their children, yet we are forcing our sons and our daughters to be slaves. And some of our daughters have already been enslaved, but it is not in our power to help it, for other men have our fields and our vineyards. I was very angry when I heard their outcry in these words. I took counsel with myself, and I brought charges against the nobles and the officials. I said to them, you are exacting interest, each from his brother. And I held a great assembly against them and said to them, we, as far as we are able, 
have bought back our Jewish brothers who have been sold to the nations. But you even sell your brothers that they may be sold to us. They were silent and could not find a word to say. And so I said, the thing that you are doing is not good. Ought you not to walk in the fear of our God to prevent the taunts of the nations, our enemies? Moreover, I and my brothers and my servants are lending them money and grain. Let us abandon this exacting of interest. Return to them this very day their fields, their vineyards, their olive orchards, and their houses, and the percentage of money, grain, wine, and oil that you have been exacting from them. Then they said, We will restore these and require nothing from them. We will do as you say. And I called the priests and made them swear to do as they had promised. I also shook out the fold of my garment and said, So may God shake out every man from his house and from his labor who does not keep this promise. So may he be shaken out and emptied. And all the assembly said, Amen, and praised the Lord. And the people did as they had promised. Moreover, from the time that I was appointed to be their governor in the land of Judah, from the 20th year to the 32nd year of Artaxerxes the king, 12 years, neither I nor my brothers ate the food allowance of the governor. The former governors who were before me laid heavy burdens on the people and took from them for their daily ration 40 shekels of silver. Even their servants lorded it over the people. But I did not do so because of the fear of God. I also persevered in the work of this wall, and we acquired no land, and all my servants were gathered there for the work. Moreover, there were at my table 150 men, Jews and officials, besides those who came to us from the nations that were around us. Now what was prepared at my expense for each day was one ox, six choice sheep, and birds, and every ten days all kinds of wine in abundance. Yet for all this I did not demand the food allowance of the governor, because the service was too heavy on this people. Remember for my good, O oh my God, all that I have done for this people. It's the word of God for the people of God. And so what we see in this passage, Christ-likeness 101. Um, we all have blind spots, spiritual blind spots. I hate driving on roads, and you kind of just know. We talk about the one right side of Limeboro all the time. You're like, can I go? Can I not go? And then you go, and you realize you shouldn't have, but it's too late. You're already in the lane. So just, no one hit me. Blind spots. We hate them. We get stuff on our cars now that ding for us in case we don't see it. And we all have spiritual blind spots, and the worst part about blind spots is we don't know about them because they're blind spots. And so unless we have someone else kindly, lovingly go, hey, brother or sister, you might not know, you might not have seen, you might not have heard, but, um, and then insert loving rebuke here. And so some of us, we are blind we don't see, we don't hear, we don't feel the cries of those who are hurting and broken in this world. We know that there are broken people. We know that there are people that are hurting. Um, but do we know them? Do we have listening ears? Or do we have um, deaf ears and blind spots? And so Christ likeness 101, there's a couple things. First, we hear the cry of the oppressed. And when I mean oppressed, I'm not just, you know, there's a lot of oppression in this world. There's a lot of corrupt government people. There's a lot of corruption, period. But the cry of the oppressed that Jesus talks about when he has come to set the captive free, those who are spiritually dead to make them alive. Do we hear the cries of the oppressed those who are in bondage and enslaved to sin? Do we hear their problems? Do we care about their problems? Are we sympathetic words like, I cannot wait to rush in and help because I have the solution? 
I have the gospel right here, and you need only to believe it and to live it out. Also, Christ likeness 101, not just hearing the cries of those who need it, but being concerned about actual repentance. You know, not just like, oh, I know what I did was wrong. You know, and we talked, we've already talked about this too, where you pray for forgiveness before you commit the sin. It's like, you know, forgive me for what I'm about to do. So just don't do it. You gotta, like, we joke around, well, it's better to ask for forgiveness than for permission. <laughs> um, it's like, eh. Um, it's like, no. It's like, if you have to be forgiven of it, don't do it. That's a good motto, you know. Um, and then also Christ likeness 101, final exam. God's people must be willing to give up their own privileges for the sake of others, always dying to self. That is not easy. I don't want to die. I'm here to live. And, you know, someone's got to look out for me. And if it's not me, then who? And so we want to hear the cries of people that need the gospel, that need the Lord, the cry of those who are oppressed. In this particular instance, it's, it's Nehemiah's people, the people of Israel, those who are poor, um, and how the irony that their own brethren are oppressing them. Uh, you know, Don't you remember Egypt? Don't you remember what it was like to be in the wilderness? Don't you remember all these things? when we were in exile in Babylon and Assyria, and now you, of all people, would understand the frustration of having someone lord over you, and you owe them money, or and they owe you, and it's just goodness, let alone your own brothers and sisters. That is messed up. This is family. So in the first five verses, we hear this outcry. It's what sparks the whole chapter in the first place. Um, and it's a very high emotional um, call of distress. It's very high level. And you can't see it in the English, in the Hebrew. It's actually like usually the context of like hearing a great outcry is usually during a time of war or injustice, where like the wailing of the Jews during their slave enslavement in Egypt. Lord, do you hear our prayers? Um, you care about us, and it's not just um, crying out, but we learn in, in verse 1 that it's the people, it's also so the men, it's their wives, um, calling out against their Jewish brothers, um, ironically. And so they're complaining about a couple things, actually. Um, I know that the wall, it, it's not an easy thing to build a wall. Um, we see that uh, firsthand. Um, but wall construction during this time took a lot of time, um, but it was too short to really have caused this crazy, like, why is there a famine, right? We just pop up and now there's a famine uh, in the land. Was it the wall? All the men are building and they're not working in the fields, so we have no food. Um, or maybe it's the fact that you have other neighbors that, you know, we learned that they didn't fight them last week because Nehemiah. Like we got spears, we got swords, you're not going to take advantage of us. But, you know, there's other ways. And we've seen it in our own country where leaders and people in power will try to do other ways, you know, to kind of hold people back or to make sure they're heard or that their plans and purposes are accomplished. And so, you know, there might be a famine, not because the men couldn't work the field, let's say, but now there's taxes. We all hate taxes, don't we? Um, there's no food. Maybe they're not able to go to the market now because, like, well, so long as you're building this wall in opposition to us, you can't shop here unless you wear a mask. No. Um, you can't come in. That's a, that's a joke. <laughs> Stay safe. I don't know. Wear one if you got to. Um, but there's a famine in the land. Okay, now they have lots of people. We finally have a wall, and for what? to starve. They're an agrarian society. If they don't have food, they don't get to go to Walmart, they don't get to go to Wegmans, they die. Um, and so we learn in verse 2 through 4, they are scared. And there's actually three complaints that are brought up. Verse 2, there were those who said, with our sons and our daughters, we are many. Let us go get, uh, get grain that we may eat and 
keep alive. We just want to stay alive. And so the first group, they're probably the most desperate. They're landless. Their role, their sole reason is to obtain grain. We just want to live. Okay. We just need some grain to live. So our children will be kept alive. And then Verse 3, there's a second group. There were those who said, we are mortgaging our fields, our vineyards, and our houses to get grain because of the famine. And so they share the same need. They also need grain, but they have fields. They have vineyards. And so it's like, see, you're privileged. You have fields, you have vineyards, we have nothing. But we actually learn that these fields are their only source of income. It's like you telling a farmer, you don't have to starve. You have a bunch of corn in your field. It's like, well, the corn, that's what I sell to live. I'm eating my income, if you will. And so essentially they are mortgaging their fields. And they need grain. And they're also mortgaging their houses as well. And then there's this third group. Third group, verse 4. And then there were those who said, we have borrowed money for the king's tax on our fields and our vineyards. Now all our flesh is as the flesh of our brothers. Our children are as their children. Yet we are forcing our sons and our daughters to be slaves. Some of our daughters have already been enslaved, but it's not in our power to help it. For other men have our fields and our vineyards. And so this third group, they need to borrow money to pay the king's tax. What an unfortunate, dire, horrible situation. I need to borrow money to pay you money (laughs) that I owe the government. I just owe the government. And so now it's just, it's a very bad situation. Nehemiah, yes, we built the wall, but for what? What do we have to show for it? The people are still suffering. We're struggling. Do you hear their cries? And verse 5 really summarizes all three groups. They've had to not just mortgage out their fields. They're not, they have to eat their income. But now they have to give their own children as collateral to these people that maybe over time with their service, they can pay off the family debt. Um, and I can only imagine the heavy and painful burden it would have been for those parents. Like, I know, sweetheart, I know, um, but you know, you got to go help out in their house because, you know, we would you want to, you know, die free or live um, working? It's like better to be alive, right? Um, and so they're giving their own children, they're giving their own land as payment. For the land, they have nothing to show for themselves. Um, and then, and then, I just can't emphasize this enough that the tragic reality that it's, it's their own Jewish brothers, their own brethren, their their blood, their relatives, um, and cr- Christians enslaving other Christians, if you will. You could just imagine, like something that should not have been characterized. Um, for the people of God is what is happening. And so what is Nehemiah to do? You know, what is he here? I mean, this is a dire situation. He's approached with, like, this is happening under my nose. These are my people. This is happening on my watch. What is going on? I'm a good governor, as we learn later on in verses 14 through um, 19. But I think at least for the for us, one, don't do that. Okay, that's really simple. Don't oppress other people. Don't enslave other Christians. Sound good? Great. Um, but deeper than that, are we hearing the cries of people in our lives? You know, God being our perfect example, he did not ignore Israel's cries in the past. We look at the scriptures, especially the Psalms, where we see the promise that he hears us in our distresses. And so I think as God's people, we must imitate the same way. And I'm calling this out in my own life as well. You see someone begging on the side of the road. 
You're praying that they don't try to wash your car window. Is the first thought that pops in your head, is it sympathy? Is it concern? Is it wondering how they got there? Or is the first thought assumptions about how they got there? Well, if I just give them money, I'm an enabler. It's like, how do we know? What are you enabling? What if they really do just want food? We see a single mom with three kids in the checkout line at Walmart. And the kids just aren't behaving. Well, you know, well, where's their father? As opposed to, well, maybe I can just give you an extra hand real quick um, with your groceries to your car. We see a family that loses their house. And it's like, well, that's on them, them for buying a house more than they could afford. As opposed to, well, maybe he lost his job and his wife hurt her back, so she can't work. Are we even hearing the cries of people? And then when we do hear their cries, do we believe them? There are people that take advantage, yes. There are people that spread the truth, yes. And they prey on the kindness of others. But have we allowed that to become the norm instead of the exception? Where all people are just the same. Maybe there are people that just need a little kindness and the love of Christ in their situation. So I think it's vital for us here at St. Paul's, you know, we don't just blame people for economic distress. I mean, we are, how long have we been looking for our house? Still looking? And we just like go on Zillow and you're like, why? Because it's like, unless it's haunted or someone got murdered or foreclosed, 400,000, you know, two bedroom. It's not even a real bedroom. You know, this bathroom's AKA a hallway um, and a dining room, my goodness. Uh, not to make excuses, but it's, it's tough. Um, it's like, can you believe he's still living with his in-laws? No one said that here. I'm just saying. It's just, I'm thinking it. <laughs> uh, they're great. They're great. But, you know, anyway. It's like, you know, what's going on? You know, do we hear the outcry? And this is great injustice. This is brother on brother. This should never even be happening. Um, And so I don't like that's happening in the world. May it definitely never happen um, in God's church, Christ's church, especially not here at St. Paul's. Um, Help us to have eyes that see and ears that hear. But if that does happen, or any sin for that matter, may we actually be concerned about repentance. May we be willing, may we be humble, public even, where it's like, you know what, I said something last week. You know what, you know, I hope it didn't come across this way, but it might have, and so I just want to clear it up with you, brother, sister. Oh, I hope I wasn't hurt this way. I hope you didn't take, like, you know, um, and you talk like a family um, and repent if it's necessary and move on. Because this is what happens. Thankfully, they don't push back. They don't go to their defense. They don't go, Nehemiah, this is uncalled for. They repent. Nehemiah first responds to the leaders. Good start. We lead by example. Um, like, this happened on your watch. Uh, and so he goes to them in verse 12. and then, But he gets rightly outraged. Verse 6, I was very angry when I heard their outcry in these words. I took counsel with myself and I brought charges against the nobles and the officials. And so up to this point, it's interesting that Nehemiah has never described himself as angry. We've looked at the first four chapters. Now we're looking at chapter five. And up to this point, yeah, he's never been angry, even though there's lots of oppositions, uh, opposition, lots of adversaries, lots of times where he could have been angry. Um, and gotten angered, and yet this is the first time we learn about it. And it's when the disadvantaged within the community are oppressed by their own brothers. 
And so he is rightly angry over this outcry. Um, and so Nehemiah not only exhorts these leaders, hey, okay, it's stopping, and it's stopping right now. Um, but he shows a model for handling um, community strife. So it's inevitable. Uh, we step on toes, and we're just trying to do it as hard as possible. Um, so in this volatile situation, he takes time. He pauses, verse 7, he takes counsel in himself, but then he goes to the leaders and he says this to them, you are exacting interest each from his brother. And then after that, he gathers a whole assembly against them and he says to them, we, as far as we are able, have bought back our Jewish brothers who have been sold to the nations, but you even sell your brothers that they may be sold to us. In verse 8, we, this is essentially a family meeting, and every family has its own dysfunctions. Hopefully it's not me all the time. But every family, we have that family tree, and you're like, just don't, we're going to cut down that one branch, you know, like that limb. we got to trim up that limb a little bit, you know, Uncle Andy. Um, uh, but, like, could you imagine... Uh, He's addressing the, this family. They have people that are in servitude. They're literally enslaved. And as if being enslaved by Gentiles during the exile wasn't distressing enough, now we have brothers with economic advantage actually doing the selling of their own brothers. This is a horrible, horrible act. And so he calls for them to repent. He tells them... Uh, we learn that they were silent in verse 8. They were silent. They could not find a word to say. Do you remember being a young boy, young girl? Your parents are like, what were you thinking? And you're like, I wasn't thinking. You know, how could this have happened? And you're like, because oh, I did it. Like, I don't know. And you just, you know, you, you have nothing to say, right? Um, and you're like, oh gosh, when is this going to be over? <laughs> uh but this is, you know, they are silent. They couldn't find a word to say. Nehemiah does not let off the gas. He says, you know what, while I'm here, so I said, the thing that you are doing is not good. This is verse 9. Ought you not to walk in the fear of our God to prevent the taunts of the nations, our enemies? You can imagine, right? Look, we let them build a wall for what? So they could just do this to themselves. We don't have to oppress them. They'll just do it to each other. Brilliant. The mockery. And so verse 10, Moreover, I and my brothers and my servants were lending them money and grain. Let us abandon this exacting of interest. In short, he's saying, they're your brothers. You give to them without repayment. You give to them because they are your brothers. You show them kindness. You show them grace. It is no longer a you owe me. It's a, hey, nope. We're family. By helping you, I'm helping me. He's leading as an example. He, give, he has given his own money, his own grain. He's not calling them to do something that he is not also willing to do. And so it's beautiful when he says, return them this very day, their fields, their vineyards, their olive orchards, their houses, their percentage of money, grain, wine, oil, anything that you have been exacting from them. Verse 12, then they said, we will restore these and require nothing from them. We will do as you say. There's no debate. There's no counterproposal. No pushback. They go, you're right. We're supposed to be better. We are supposed to be different. You can imagine him, Nehemiah being a pastor. You can go, think about the gospel. Think about how enormous of a debt you have totaled up on your spiritual account. A debt that could only be paid by someone dying in your place. And if Christ in His love and His mercy was able to cancel 
such a debt? How are we able to stand validated, vindicated, in right standing, and not also be willing to cancel the debtors that are our brothers and sisters? And so he is able to say in verse 13, when he shook out the fold of his garment, he said, so may God shake out every man from his house and from his labor, and who does not keep this promise, so may he be shaken out and emptied. Like emptying one's own pockets. I can't do that right now because they're not empty. Ironically, got keys. But like emptying one's own pockets, he's essentially saying, may God ring you out, throw you out, let you go from his hands if you do not keep this promise. And so the community, they respond, they respond. All the assembly said, Amen, and praised the Lord, and the people did as they had promised. And so what I want for us, we can think of people, and it's not like we're just like, you know what? You know, the you go to Audi and you borrow a cart and you put the quarter in and then, you know, you're going to put the cart back and someone's going, oh, no, here, you can have my cart. I'm like, well, do you want the quarter? It's like, you can keep the quarter. And then I go self-righteous back to my car. You know, I donated 25 cents. Ugh, I'm such a good person, you know. Gosh, I could be Jesus for a day. Oh, gosh. Christ like this 101. Like, come on. Like, what does it mean? And I've been working on, like, you know, if we do, like, almost like a Saturday thing all day on, like, forgiveness. Canceling a debt. When you see a mom meet with her son's murderer in prison weekly and forgive him, that's canceling a debt. Going up to the one who maybe you know, went into business with you and you were going to have this great company and this great vision only for them to not really do a lot of the work. You make it successful, it starts booming, and then they steal from you. Leave, you take them to the court. Somehow they manage to win. Take your business from you. Run it into the ground. And you go, you know what? The Lord's forgiven me. I can forgive them. That is canceling a debt, not 25 cents at all. And there was no debt. I mean, what? You owe me a quarter to the individual I'll never meet again, maybe. And so Nehemiah is courageous. He's compassionate in that he confronts these people lovingly, patiently, but confronts them, brings them to repentance. And it ultimately restores the whole community. I mean, Thanksgiving dinner is a whole lot different when you have your people back and you're like, you sold me. And like, enjoy your grain. Like, enjoy it. It's here because of me. So Nehemiah pauses. He takes time. He prays. And then he confronts. He cares about their repentance. He calls them to return. And this is what the people does. They don't, um, they don't look after their own vindicate, vindication. They don't make their own case. But they meet, respond with silence, no excuses, and they repent. And then Nehemiah, it's interesting that this is in chapter 4 because we still have a couple chapters to look at, but he wants to show his hand, to tip his cards and show you how he tried to lead as an example. He didn't make the people do something that he wasn't willing to also do. It's not tooting his own horn, but showing that even leaders, leaders of all people actually, are supposed to be first in giving up their own privileges for the sake of others, dying to themselves. You think of Christ washing his disciples' feet. Peter says, Lord, who are, I should be washing your feet. He says, don't you understand that if I don't wash you, you won't be clean. It has to be me. 
And so who better than for the nation's governor to show that even over his 12-year stretch of being their governor, he talks about how neither I nor my brothers, this is verse 14, ate the food allowance of the governor. And you might be like, okay, cool, you just didn't eat the food that was in your pantry. But it's amazing. They're like, he's like, no, this was something that was a right, something that I earned as being governor. It is my due. It's not like I'm taking something that is not rightfully mine. But he understands, what would that say of me? While my people that I'm leading are starving. And here I am, enjoying my food. And so, so he abstains from it. He doesn't charge them taxes like other people had done. He also helps them actually build a wall, promises them safety and security. And so I just love this, where we see the example of Christ, Christ-likeness 101, where he then even says, Lord, may everything I have done, would you remember me? Would you remember me for good and what I have done for this people, his sacrifice for others. So I think as a church, you know, we should look for opportunities um, to grow ourselves spiritually, which um, ironically uh, usually means a lot of self-sacrifice. Um, even if it's our financial security or our social standing, um, to bear Christ in this world. And so we might be out here in the country. Um, we might be older. We might not be tech savvy. We might not have a lot of energy. Whatever you might think our hindrance is. But as so long as we are preaching the word of God, we're doing so faithfully and we're trying to grow in Christ's likeness. We're giving to all who have need each as we prosper with joy in our hearts, loving God and loving one another then I think we will be a success story. You know, in ministry, especially being a leader, you always have to be careful about how you define success in ministry. What does it mean to be a successful pastor, a successful church? And God thankfully and gracefully says, a successful church is a faithful one. One who is faithful, loves my word, loves me, and loves one another. If you start there, you can build on it. That is Christ-likeness 101. So hear their cries. Think about actual repentance and be willing to die to yourself as you live for him. Let's pray.